Hello, I'm Erica from the British Society for Immunology. Welcome and thank you for joining us on our fifth vaccine COVID Q&A. Today I'm joined by Dr. Anne Ogbe from the University of Oxford. Thank you for being with us today. Hello, Anne. Hello, Erica. It's really lovely to be here with you all. So let's get straight into it. Question number one, how would you try to address the hesitancy of the black community to take the vaccine? So it is true that there is distrust in some communities when it comes to their interest being protected in terms of healthcare delivery. And I think some of the distrust comes from a, le a lack of clear and concise um, information. And if I were to tackle this, some of the things I'll be looking to do would be um, enhanced um, public engagement and transparency in terms of data reporting. Um, I think it would also be good to have inclusion and visibility of black scientists and um, policymakers at different stages of the vaccine development process. And also it would be um, um, very good to have effective and targeted communication um, for different communities because um, one size does not fit all in this case. Um, and my message to the black community would be um, COVID-19 has disproportionately affected us. Um, we're four times more likely to die from COVID-19 than any other ethnicity. So if you're offered the vaccine, if you get a chance to take the vaccine, um, please do not hesitate, go for it. Question number two, how do we know which vaccine is better? Um, so this is a really good question. And um, what I'd like to say in um, terms of what vaccine is better is that we need to remember that all of the currently licensed vaccine have been rigorously tested tested for safety and efficacy in um, a range of people from different demographics. And um, it's been shown that they are 65 to 95% um, effective at reducing moderate to severe COVID-19. So um, the bottom line is that all the vaccines are safe and effective. And if you're offered any, take it. Question number three, how do scientists determine long-term effects before they are used long-term? It's um, important to remember that COVID-19 is a relatively new disease and um, the vaccines have only been in circulation for a few months. We know from previous studies that um, if a person is going to develop adverse side effect, that's more likely to occur in the short term than in the long term. And this is because the immune system is able to um, break up the vaccine components and clear that away. Um, however, um, you know, continual monitoring and surve surveillance of um, the participants in the vaccine trials, as well as people that have received the vaccine, would be needed to determine long-term effect. And um, there is um, um, there are systems in place, um, like the Yellow Card scheme from the MHRA. Question number four: When will we know if immunosuppressants affect how effective the vaccine is? So we currently do not have that information. However, there are a lot of studies um, that are ongoing that we hope would be able to address that. Um, and what we do know from previous work is that um, people that are Im on immunosuppressants are still able to develop immunity to um, a pathogen from vaccination. We do not expect this immunity to be optimal, but they are still able, the key message is that they are still able to develop an immune response against a pathogen following vaccination. So if you're within this group and you're offered a chance to get the COVID-19 vaccine, I would strongly recommend that you do get it. Question number five, are there animal products in the COVID vaccines? I think this is a really great question, especially as I know that there are some people who, um, for a number of reasons, um, you know, including lifestyle um, or um, religious reasons, are not able to consume animal products. So I think it's important um, for me to give you a bit of um, a historical context. So historically, vaccines are made up of two main ingredients. Um, the active ingredient, which would be a component from your pathogen of interest, and an adjuvant. And the adjuvant is usually used to um, effectively engage the immune system. And these adjuvants can either be um, synthetic or um, made from um, natural products, including animal products like squalene. However, with advances in um, vaccine technology, we've been able to um, develop vaccine delivery platforms that no longer need this adjuvant. And um, 
all of the COVID-19 vaccines that have been licensed for use at the moment do not have um, any adjuvant. You can see this information from the patient information sheet for the vaccine and the MHRA website. So the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine have got no animal products whatsoever. Question number six, how likely is it that we will need a new COVID vaccine every year? I think this would um, depend on the durability of the immune response. Um, we know that from natural infection, um, people are able to maintain their um, immunity to um, SARS-CoV-2 um, eight months after infection. Um, so, you know, there's no reason for us to believe that um, vaccine um, responses would be any different. If anything, it should be better. Um, but there, it also depends on, um, you know, the mutations on the virus and how much the pre-existing immunity from either natural infection or vaccination is able to offer protection from um, infection with um, mutant viruses. So um, I would say that if, you know, currently the data does show that um, um, the um, neutralizing antibodies that we have from um, vaccination um, is able to protect against circulating strains, the current circulating strains. However, if the vaccine does mutate and is no longer recognized by our existing immune system, it is possible that we would need to update the vaccine yearly. And it's, you know, it's important to remember that this is no different from the yearly flu vaccines that we receive. Question number seven, if a single dose of the vaccine is 80% effective, do we need two doses? I think this has come off the back of um, a recently published um, preprint where um, they had shown that in adults aged over 60, there was 80% protection after um, first dose. And I think this is really good data. However, we still need a second dose to offer full long-term protection. And um, it's important to explain how the immune system works in order for you to get the picture. So the first dose, which we call the priming dose, um, basically sets your immune system to work. Your immune system starts to make antibodies. And then these antibodies, um, they could be made in high amounts. Um, however, they're not fully committed to memory and they could wane over time. And this is where you need a booster dose, which then, um, you know, allows your immune system to re-recognize the um, antigen and then um, fully commit it to memory so that you're fully protected for a much longer time. So the summary is that you do need the second dose. Question number eight, will we need to still wear masks after the vaccine? The answer to this is yes. You still need to follow all of the government guidelines even after vaccination. And the reason for this is that we know that um, you know, vaccine would provide um, protection from severe disease. However, it does take up to three weeks for this protection to be mounted. So in the meantime, you need to protect yourself. And also what's important is that even though we know that the vaccine prevents um, severe disease, it does not prevent transmission. So um, you need to protect yourself and protect everyone around you by following the government guidelines. So um, wear your mask, keep your distance and wash your hands. So the final question, question number nine has come from Twitter. Were they developed too fast? I think this is a great question and it keeps reoccurring. Um, and the answer is no, but allow me to tell you why I think the answer is no. Um, it is true that in normal times, it would take between 10 to 15 years to get a vaccine for any um, 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 disease. However, we've had a functional COVID-19 vaccine developed in less than a year. And I have tried to condense the reason for this into um, three factors. So I'll start with the first, which was collaborative work. So because we were in a state of emergency, pretty much every research scientist from virologists, vaccinologists and immunologists dropped everything else we had to do and focused on COVID-19 research. So personally, I'm, I, I work in HIV immunology, but for the first eight months of the pandemic, I did nothing other than COVID-19 immunology. The other reason would be um, that we're building on um, existing um, scientific work. So um, we know that you know, in the last 10 to 15 years, there've been tremendous um, advances in um, basic scientific research and um, vaccine um, development. 
we know that um, the stabilization of the proteins and the um, um, mRNA um, was um, done from information from um, the SARS-CoV-1 and the MERS epidemic. So we were really not starting from scratch. So in addition to all hands being on deck, we had all this information that we could build up on. And it is true that if we had had this pandemic um, 20 years ago, we wouldn't have advanced so quickly in um, getting a vaccine as we did now. And then the last factor would be funding. Again, because we're in a state of emergency, funding was readily made available. And so um, we're able to um, concentrate efforts on um, trying to get the vaccine out. And it meant that um, some of the stages in the um, trials that would have been done you know, after the other because of funding limitations could now run alongside each other, which um, really made the process um, a lot quicker. That said, um, it's important for me to also say that um, in all of this, there was never um, 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 a question of compromising safety. We did make sure that everything that, uh, that we did was um, safe before it was approved. Thank you so much, Anne. That was really brilliant answers. And thank you everyone for submitting those questions. And we'll definitely see you again. So goodbye, Anne, and thank you. Bye, and thank you guys for um, sending your questions through.